Oh my god, we're back! It's time for my- I'm feeling good. See how loud I got? I only get really loud when I feel good, and that's when I blow out Doug's ear holes. That's what I like to do on these intros. All right, we got a good giveaway for you. In fact, one of the best giveaways we've ever done on YouTube. You ready for this? Here's what you win. Map Strong and Maps Powerlift. Two programs you can win for doing the following. Now, in today's episode in the intro, we talk about a very, very important scientific study on men, growers versus showers. They actually funded the study. Isn't that crazy? Ever wonder why we don't have a cure for cancer? It's because we're spending money on stuff like this. Anyway, <laughs> in the comments, be honest. Just say grower or shower. Tell us about yourself a little bit. If we pick your comment and we select you, you'll get free access to Map Strong and Maps Powerlift. Isn't that great? By the way, both those programs are 50% off right now. You can find them at Maps fitnessproducts.com. Just use the code August Special with no space for that discount. One more thing, subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. You got to do those things if you want to win free stuff from us that we give away all the time. All right. Enjoy the show. I want to ask uh, Adam about his uh, his diet. It looks like it's working, huh? Getting lean, bro. <laughs> you, I'm not eating. You're on, a, hey, you're on the. I can't taste I'm anything. The, diet. I'm on the bat soup diet, dude. I, I'm gonna write a. I'm gonna write a book when we're. When Nothing we're tastes going. good diet. No, yeah, that's the one. The one thing for me has been, uh, which was weird because it, it didn't. That didn't happen. I want to say till like day five or six, and and I can taste foods salty stuff tastes okay to me so uh like soup is like still the my favorite thing to have right now because it's the only thing that i feel tastes somewhat normal everything else has this weird taste almost like uh katrina was trying to get me to describe it i said you know what it tastes like you ever go eat something like or, or have orange juice right after you brush your teeth oh i hate that oh, it, it tastes really? like it, all, okay. all food tastes like i just brushed my teeth oh, and then i, I went that. and ate then i, I could, went and ate food i could tell your sense of taste was Weird. off when you when i saw your shoes today i was like geez this guy is <laughs> <laughs> his taste is way off bro. you are hey, in, show your you, shoes <laughs> show your shoes justin oh, dude, Please, just hey, opened up a what can, is that dude. anyway what's what do you see huh just can you see from there or no uh no, not really. What is that? Really These are vans, bro. Well, I know they're vans. What's that? Oh picture? yeah, vans are good, yeah, dude. What there's is? A, there's a hot chicken. Hey, there's a hot chicken a skeleton on my shoes, bro. Oh, yeah, I guess that's oh, all right then. This guy over here that's with awesome. the, the fucking therapeutic no, shoes is trying to give me shit about. It. <laughs> hey, what do you call them? New Balance is. He's got grandpa shoes on. No, they're not, bro. Look, look at these. These are good. I get DMs like every day about trying to talk to you about your outfits. I'm like, I can't talk to this guy, dude. The more you talk to this guy about his outfits, the the more he. Deal, digs his heels in. Yeah, the more I just do what I... I like this new earpiece thing that we got here, Doug. I feel like I'm in the CIA right now. You know what I mean? Yeah. It looks a little better yeah, on you, camera. You, hold you're on. a little more important today. Yeah, hold, on. hold on. Hold so on. So that's good. Hold on. Yeah. Anyway. Hey, I uh, I wanted you to bring up the, the studies that I see going around right now. There's a lot... and Because we brought up like just a month ago, I was talking about... I had read something in, in regards to like, you know, childhood obesity going up and there's stuff that I see in our space that's... Yeah, the study showed that uh, a majority of kids' diets is processed food majority almost 70 percent so almost 70 oh percent of what a kid eats in america today comes out of a box or a wrapper or is processed oh yeah that's a big problem it's a big problem because uh well processed foods themselves are probably not as healthy as whole natural foods but besides that probably well, uh, people will argue, you know, what well, some of them are good, some whatever. Fine, uh, won't make that argument. Although I, I definitely think they're it's a not pretty something. weak argument. But well, yeah. everything is processed, right? So yeah. that's that's the argument. The argument is that like everything is a little bit processed, a little bit, right? Yeah. But but here's the real thing: proven, proven in studies that processed foods make you overeat a lot, like to the tune of about 500 calories a day. And the studies they do are really good, controlled crossover studies, 500 more calories a day. So you give your kid processed foods and they're just going to overeat. That's why kids are fat right now. That's why there's so many obese kids. It's really crazy uh, what's going on. So that's what the study shows. Well, that's, I mean, it's a scary thought when, when that's going on at the same time when we have, you know, COVID going rampant and the variants that are happening right now. And I saw some stat, was it 79 or 80% of all deaths? Uh, the the number one thing they all had in common was obese. obese. Yeah, yeah. Obese. Yeah, it, it was like three times more likely you're gonna ha have a lot of problems with it. Yeah, if you you're are. Obese. Yeah, you know what though? We never talk about ever talk about how to how important it is to just 
improve your general health. Part of that, I think, is because people just don't listen. Because I've had clients that were doctors, and we'd have these conversations. You know, I trained a bunch of uh, vascular surgeons at one point. And, you know, if, you, if you're a vascular surgeon, a couple things your patients have in common. One is they probably all smoke. And two is they, most of them are obese, right? And I tell them, like, do you talk to your clients about or your patients about, like, diet and exercise? And they'd say, well, yeah, but it's totally a waste of time. Like nobody, yeah. they do not want to listen. They just want to take a pill. And even then sometimes they're a pain in the ass and they forget to take their, their medication. So I think that's part of it. You know, people want to hear, yeah. you got to change your lifestyle. Did that's- you see the the post that Dr. Gabriel Lyon did on that as far as doctors and nutrition kind of defending that? Like she doesn't think that doctors should have any more nutrition schooling and which I don't, dis- I don't disagree, but the challenge I have with that is because she's like, you know, I don't think that we should hold them accountable because that's not what they're that's not what they went to school for in the first place was to give nutritional advice. The only problem that I have with that is that because they're a PhD, the the general population assumes that they have yeah. and they're a doctor assumes that they have all this nutritional knowledge. So that's the only problem I I don't I don't think that they should be held accountable. I don't think we should be seeking our no. advice there. But I so long for as long as I've been a trainer that was one of the number one hurdles as a as a trainer coach that I had I had to overcome was if a, a client came to me and their doctor gave them nutritional advice, even with yeah. my background being in nutrition, and and I no matter what I said, I couldn't I couldn't overcome their doctor telling them. Yeah, the they have way thing. more authority. Yes. Uh, immediately. Yes. Yeah, behind behind their letters. So it's yeah, it's it's that's the problem, really. Yeah. Well, some uh, of the I mean, cr- and I mean, if you if you're not like super versed in that subject, you know, don't really just throw it out there as as a uh, fact. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll ask you guys this question. Uh, what are some of the craziest diets you've seen people be put on? I've seen clients that I've trained in some of the craziest diets that they were put on were put super on super low calorie by doctors. Yeah. Where they yeah. Come, literally like 500 calorie diets. Yeah. Like bars. I, yeah. Exactly. It's ridiculous. I had people come to me and, and say, you know, I'd say, so tell me about your nutrition. I know you want to lose weight. Oh, um, I'm on a liquid diet right now to lose weight. Yeah. That was the most common. Didn't, weren't yep. they part, weren't the hospitals or Kaiser partnered with one of those? Protein yeah, bars, like obesity shake. clinics. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, some they, Met, MetRx or something. One of those. I don't know if it's MetRx, but I remember they had they 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 had a program when we worked at Santa Teresa. I remember they had some program where if you if you went in there and your BMI was whatever, that was the like liquid diet. Yeah, the go to. And was you know this. why the studies will be like, oh yeah, you know, twelve weeks or sixteen weeks, people on a liquid diet lost all this weight, and they're like, it works. This is what we're going to have you do, and yeah, completely ignore. Weeks the longevity or the sustainability of it. So it was hard to argue with these people because as a trainer, I'm liable if I disagree with their doctor. Right. That's the thing that you're trained as a trainer. Like, no, oh, I, I, I agree. Life or death, I agree, right? You know, like if you got somebody who is, you know, morbidly obese and, and doctors like- Like super emergency? Yeah, like, and they're sure. like, hey, you've got a year possibly to live, then, you know, at that point, it's like, okay, well, we need to take any extreme measure to, to get this weight off or else you're going to potentially die in your sleep. I understand that, yeah. but it's not a it's not a long term solution. No, but I had a lot of people that were not life or death that were put on these ridiculous diets from doctors. Very hard to argue with them. I had clients who were prescribed weight loss <laughs> drugs, like you know Fenfen or you know stuff like that. Oh, the doctors gave it to me, so therefore, so that's the challenge. The challenge is that if people people need to understand that doctors are really good at some stuff. It's nutrition's not one of those. So, things. do you think they should have to get more nutrition schooling? I mean, what's your opinion on that? <laughs> I think that they should have resources and be directed yeah. to direct people to those resources. That's what I think. There I should think. be like a department in there in conjunction with them, at least to consult. Yep. You know, yep, yep. Like it, at least they can like defer over to a nutritionist to kind of counsel them. At well, the, the problem time with they need it. the po- problem with the problem with referring like that is the liability issue. I think that's why they don't right. Like to, why? Mm. I mean, like why you think like oh why don't they just refer like a great source of nutritional knowledge and I guess because everyone there's such an individual variance with everybody that no matter how great the nutritional advice is is not perfect for everybody right well that's why I think they should have people that work with them you know who can individualize that that's what I <clears throat> luckily you know I did I, I developed good relationships with a lot of doctors and they ended up sending me a lot of their patients, but that's not standard care. You know, most doctors don't have, don't refer to people who understand well, yeah, back exercise. To the liability well, the, thing. 
there's got to be something because obviously this is a major contributing factor to how poorly people are dealing with this disease. You know, it's like we got to address this and stop pussyfooting around the fact that we need to get healthier and this should be an alarm you know, for people to, to get back in and, and create better habits. Well, well, you know what? It's it's more than the obvious because here's the obvious. The obvious is, uh, okay, if you're obese, you have, um, you're have you more expensive to take care of, especially towards the end of life. You're So it's expensive to take care of. You have to be on more medications, higher risk of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and all that stuff. But then there's all these un, you know, seen effects that, that we don't really realize. For example... When you're unhealthy, you're less productive, right? So you're a less productive uh, part of society, at least compared to the version of you who is healthy. So if you take someone who's obese and then they're healthy, the healthy version of them will be more productive. They'll be more innovative, which is human innovation is we need that, right? It's how we solve problems. So who knows how many problems we're not solving because there's so many obese people and they're just not as innovative as they could be. Not only that, but the choices that they make drive the markets, right? So when you make choices that lead to poor health, the market feeds things that uh, that serve poor health. So go to the grocery store. You know, 90% of the food in the grocery store is unhealthy garbage, right? Because that's what the market demands. The market wants all that unhealthy garbage. If you want the whole natural foods, you walk around the perimeters. The vast majority of the grocery store yeah. is dedicated to shitty food or de- or and just markets in general dedicated to poor habits. I wonder what that I wonder what that line looks like though. It's not a perfect linear, you know, graph, right? It doesn't do mean? like as far as like you being exercising, you're more pro- all the other positive side effects of being in shape. Sure. Like where where's the where's the tipping point? At what what point um are you in shape enough that it positively impacts all the things you're alluding to I right think now? And then all- at what point does it not really matter anymore? Like how, like you're the difference between you being, uh, let's just for argument's sake, thirty five percent body fat. So if you're anything less than that, you're more productive. Sure. And then does it? At, and at that, what at what point does it not even matter that much more anymore? You know what I'm saying? Like the difference between someone who's twenty five yeah. percent versus someone who's ten percent body fat. Are they any more productive? I, I think there's two things. There's the physical effects. So when you feel good and you're actually healthy, you interpret things differently. You're more positive. You're more productive. You know all those things I talked about. But it's also the pursuit of health that leads to all those things, right? So what are the what are the <clears throat> the things that you do to pursue health in, in, in healthy ways, in real ways? I'm not talking about dysfunctional pursuit of aesthetics, but rather healthy pursuit of of good health. What are those habits, right? Well, I'm gonna be I'm gonna abstain a little bit from bad habits. I'm gonna take more responsibility for my own health. I'm gonna be better with my time management. You have to be, right, to in order to make time for exercise. Um, I'm going to value my health a little bit different. I'm going to look at food a little bit differently. So all those, the habits that you learn in the pursuit also contribute. So it's, it's way complex. I'm sure it's a sliding scale, right? The, the longer you stick with it, the better you are at other things. But I remember, so when, you know, when I would manage gyms for 24 hour fitness, we used to do what were called corporate memberships. This is where you go to, Mm -hmm. you guys know what I'm talking about. You, you'd go to a company and you would try to get the company to pay a big fee to cover part of the costs of a gym membership for the employees or whatever. And it was a big deal for the gym. It would be a lot of revenue. Some of these checks were massive. And how would you sell this to the company? Well, the way you'd sell it to the company is, well, your employees want it. But then there was studies that were actually done that showed that employees that worked out and ate right had way less sick days, cost way less on health insurance, and were more productive. And I can't remember the exact number, but these studies showed that, and this is what we would say to them, for every dollar you invest in your employees' health and fitness, you'll get back $2 in return in savings and in productivity. And this was a big selling point, right? So if you're a company and you spend $100,000 getting your employees to work out, you're going to save $200,000 in, you know, absentee, you know, people being less absent, people being more productive. So there's, a, there's way more effects from poor health than the obvious that nobody's uh, you know nobody's talking about. Um, so I wonder how much that has to do too with just having purpose, right? Oh yeah, I mean yeah. all of it, right? Mm-hmm. Like all the things you I've learned through ex- the personal responsibility alone. That's a big one. You have to you have to learn to take your health in your own hands if you pursue 
you know, exercise and nutrition at some point. And I'll tell you something, there's a big problem nowadays, and in, in, especially in, in this country and in modern societies, people don't take personal responsibility of their health. They give it to their doctors or the government, tell me what to do. It's not my, oh, that's, you know, they, they have no like real responsibility for their own health. They give it to other people. That's a, that's a bad, you know, precedent. Speaking of, yeah, which, speaking of that, I, uh, so Virgin actually was one of the companies I saw that had a really cool, uh, way of, of trying to introduce that incentivize that amongst their employees a while back. And it was like a whole corporate wellness incentive where, uh, you know, the more active they were and the more, um, you know, they worked out and made nu- nutritional habits and, and better habits. Like they would get uh, certain rewards for it. They'd lower their insurance um, and the overall productivity they proved uh, increased substantially. So, uh, you know, more companies, if they really start to tap into that and figure it out, um, you know, it's going to benefit everybody and, you know, the way that business is done as yeah. well. Yeah, I, I, I think that's I think that's coming because the healthcare is getting ridiculous. Gotta look, we've got to look at the preventative side of all this stuff. Yeah. In fact, they did a meta analysis on obesity. You know, there's a whole, um, you can be overweight and healthy, right? Oh no, you can be overweight and healthy or, yeah. you know, be obese and healthy. Well, they did a meta analysis and they showed that that's false. You could definitely be, <laughs> they needed a meta analysis for that. <laughs> well, yeah, because they showed you can definitely be healthier and be overweight if you do certain things. But in comparison to that same person, not being overweight, there's there, no matter what, just carrying lots of excess body fat is just uh, bad for you. I know it's funny they had to do it's, a yeah, it's comical to me. You know yeah. what's comical too is I see you, you know it's becoming popular is uh, more and more of these mannequins that they're that the when you go to like stores like uh, you know oh uh, yeah yeah they, they yeah. now they all have like these pot bellies and stuff like that. It's the, it's the craziest thing ever, <sighs> dude. I was talking to Courtney about this. She pointed out because we were walking past the Victoria's Secret. And along the side and towards the back of the store, like, you know, as you're walking down the sidewalk, I was like, oh, you know, it's the really attractive models. And then when you get to the front of the building, it's all the unattractive (laughs) people. I'm like, the unattractive people are selling clothes now? Like, what's happening? Dude, you know, in in Europe, uh, mannequins have nipples. That's uh, something I noticed. When I was over. Yeah, that's such what? a random fact. <laughs> well, I mean, you notice it because yeah, I, when I, no, I was twelve. That's why I was twelve years old. You notice nipples when you're twelve on anything. I remember we were in Italy on vacation and we were at a, a department store, and I'm like, you know, one of the mannequins didn't have a shirt on and they had nipples. It was like, wow, they put nipples on mannequins over here. Cool. So, so random. <laughs> that's hot, dude. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of random. Justin, you're going to love it. I don't know if you know this. This this was a study that was done. I want to say, I think it was like in the 60s that this study was done. So the CIA uh, funded a study to see if we could communicate with dolphins. So did you, are you, did you, have you heard about this? Yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. I, it, I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think I know why they shut it down, too. Yeah. Go uh, ahead. Yeah. So they gave the, they gave the dolphins LSD because they thought yeah. that maybe this would help. <laughs> them like yeah they could they could get on the same wavelength somehow and they're able to kind of like communicate on a different level so what happened somebody fucked a dolphin no yes Yes, that's why they shut it down really a researcher she was jerking off all the dolphins uh trying to to make them happy yeah and so they started having sex and shit so they had to stop the study and there wasn't like a scientific reason why she was doing this Uh, i fuck like she wasn't doing research yeah to try to explain it with like that. Yeah. No, no, no. This is uh, a <laughs> this is for research. It's positive communication. Yeah, yeah. this is totally. This is totally. That's this all. is science. Hey, speaking of old news, I have I've read this article. I was reading. I don't think it was in the hustle or so. I don't remember what it was, but I just thought it was funny and because it, it was old. It was old, and I remember these. I remember these commercials. Pepsi did this thing, this uh, campaign where it's called like Pepsi and stuff. You guys remember that? Explain it. I'm trying. To, I'm trying to remember. So they Pepsi were like, and stuff. they get it was called. I think it was called Pepsi and stuff. Was the campaign, and they gave away points. Pepsi and the, the and like the com- at the end of the commercial, this guy f- like flies into school with like an F-16. Oh shit! I remember this commercial. They got sued for this. Why? So Pepsi got sued because one guy took that commercial literally and thought sa- he could get an F-16. Saved up enough because they said like seven million points for the F-16. And and turned it in, and it went through three years of court trying to sue Pepsi uh, for not giving him an F sixteen. 
Did he win? <laughs> no, he didn't. Win. In fact, oh. I think I think Pepsi actually. Who's my F sixteen? I think Pepsi actually countersued because of all like the the legal shit that they try to drag. And they changed the, they did change the commercial because of them to make it more like a joke. I think they exaggerated to seven hundred million points, which made it very unrealistic. You could even get to that number. And then they did like a uh, ha ha ha. Afterwards. Oh my god, I remember that. Dude, leave it, yeah, leave it to the world that like somebody's yes. gonna take it literally. That's well, it. Though. It was a it was a hairier fighter. Oh, that's what it was. Seven million Pepsi points. Yes. People are ridiculous, man. <laughs> I know. I thought it was crazy that he sat down and he actually like calculated out how to figure how to get to that. And he's and I guess so. I guess you didn't have to have all of it through. Like so you get it through like cans and cups and liters. And then you could also buy Pepsi points for like I don't remember what it was like ten dollars for so many points or whatever. So he sent in a check for like you know seven hundred thousand dollars and then and however many points that he already accumulated and said I want my jet. And well, yeah, that's a that's a that's a steal for a Harrier. Well, that was exactly the, his thought process was oh my god like this is not this is so. So worth it for me to the spend. The lawsuit's like, listen, I got 7 million Pepsi points and I, all I got was diabetes. I didn't get a damn jet. <laughs> Give me my, my stupid jet. It's my jet. jet. Could you believe that was in our court system, though, for three years? For Imagine three years. being the judge on that. Yeah. I, you know, I, I wish judges would sometimes just look at people who do these lawsuits and then just be like, and just be like, this is a waste of time. Yeah, you're, yeah. Uh, sir, I'm sorry. You're really stupid. Get out of my. Court. I know. It's crazy <laughs> that something like that wouldn't just get laughed out of court immediately. Like, get out of here, dude. Like, try, trying to say that a, a commercial is is like a legal binding yeah. kind contract. Like, come on. Do, do you guys, speaking of Pepsi back in the day, do you guys remember the failed attempt at, was it Pepsi? Clear. Yeah. Yeah. Crystal, Pepsi. Yeah. Crystal? I liked it. was, yeah, Pepsi Clear. Yeah, Van, yeah, Van Hagar was uh, promoting it. I remember that. It was basically, it was Pepsi it was without clear. the coloring. So mm. it looked like 7-Up or whatever. It was clear. Yeah. It tasted like Pepsi. But it failed. It did fail miserably, I remember. Yeah, well, I, yeah thought, I liked it. it. It's weird. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you kind of expect it to be brown. I don't know. Speaking of you which, can't... you know, remember how we speculated <clears throat> that like certain candies, because I said that Fruit Loops are all the same flavor and we we're all blown, our minds were blown. Yeah. Did you know? And I, I said Skittles are all the same flavor. Yeah. It's true. They yeah. all they did is change the color and the scent of each Skittle, different color, so they'll make it smell different. But the flavoring is identical, so all Skittles are exactly the same. Just Why little, make it smell a little different? That's weird. Because yeah. that changes the experience. Tastes like sugar. It, yeah. It, yeah, it just changes the experience, and it makes you feel like oh, green is you know lime, or yellow is lemon, and red is. I don't Whatever. know if I've ever smelt my Skittles before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <true. Have> ever, <laughs> I just can't picture myself smelling Skittles. Yeah, no, it says they have different fragrances and different colors, but they all taste exactly. Well, as you chew them, it all kind of, you know, so then, it, okay. it goes in your nose. So then you mean to tell me that all those different colored bags, the purple bag, the fruity bag, the, the traditional red bag, they are, they're all the same? All the same. So when you buy a, a, a bag of tropical flavored Skittles, it's the same. same. Yeah, yeah. Original really? Skittles, same. <laughs> all now that same. I, now I feel like that's different. I, I think feel that like, maybe they're all the same in the bag. So tropical is all the same. Tropical, oh, but it's different than okay. Because I I feel like the the traditional Skittles are different than the tropical ones. Yeah. Like I can, the, you know the the ones that come in the like the baby blue bag. Like yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Those ones tasted different than the yeah. ones in the red. Dude, like, I used to eat. I, this one junior high i used to eat a bag of skittles every day every single day wow. there was a there was a kid that would sell candy in the school kind of black market candy this is funny right cuz <laughs> I, I did this for oh, a second yeah. no because you're not allowed to right cuz the school sold candy too well this one kid which i'm sure he's a millionaire entrepreneur now he figured out why don't i buy just a bunch of skittle you know bags of skittles and starburst and whatever at Costco, bring them to school and sell them for twenty five yeah. cents less, and he did, and it was all black market. Like you, you like you look around and he pull it out of his. Bag. I knew a kid like that, and I'd, I'd totally swipe off some nerds from him all the time. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. So every nerds day, was my jam, and I was trying, you know, I was trying to gain muscle, right? Because I'm a, and I had no, I just thought calories, so I just I would eat a bag of Skittles every day. <laughs> that, was, that was part of my <laughs> my bulking process was a bag of Skittles <laughs> until I figured out that Snickers has a little bit of protein. Then it was a, yeah. uh, <laughs> then it was Snickers. Hey Justin, I yeah. saw the other day on, uh, i'm assuming it's your update uh because i don't think sal has this conversation right now is the uh updates on the on the birds and the bees uh with your your boys have you had a, a you had a recent talk oh no i saw so i saw something that uh was kind of funny that was trying to to, to update that in terms of like today's 
sort of uh, lingo and and how to how to explain everything and it's like you gotta now now you have to explain not just birds and bees but bees and bees birds and birds oh shit uh like birds that look like bees bees <laughs> that identify as birds you know and then and then birds with a stinger so you know <laughs> I thought that was pretty clever. Somebody po- posted that out there, and I was like, "Oh man, dude, my my son." We're like, at that level now. So my son's sixteen. So he's you know he's he's obviously in the know. He you know you know whatever. But what's funny is that he's at the age where he thinks his parents don't know slang. You know, I remember when I was this age, I would say things thinking my parents are stupid, not realizing my parents know what the hell I'm talking about. So my br- my son, he'll ma- he'll look at me when a word is said, and he'll say, "Oh, you know, like for example." Um, you know, Jessica was talking about <laughs> going to going to the salon and getting a facial, right? <laughs> so, so my son looks at oh, me like, facial. <laughs> yeah, he looks at me and he's like, facial, oh, no. right? Huh? I'm like, dude, we know what, the, bro, <laughs> she knows what that means. Everybody knows what that means. <laughs> it's not a wink wink. Yeah, you know? dude. You're, hey, not, you know, you're he, not cool. Uh, he would be a good one to ask the whole debate and, or what a discussion that we had around like dating apps and stuff like that. Now, the, do the kids, do the kids use that stuff? Oh, yeah. Dude. Like if you're in high school, do you use that stuff? Oh, yeah. They don't, they you don't, do? yeah, yeah, they don't question. talk to each really? other. Really? In high so school? I'd like, well, no, I know, like a, I know this from, remember, lazy. Enzo used to tell us about this all the time. About dating apps? Yeah, he's he, remember Enzo would say if you saw a girl at a party. Yeah, he didn't say dating apps. He said that they would yeah, but, they would face yeah. they would Oh, DM I'm putting it all other. together. Yeah, you I'm are lumping it all together. You are lumping it together. I don't think you don't think you have any facts on this. No. Well, I did <laughs> I did have to have a pretty serious talk cuz I guess like some of the kids have phones now too cuz I mean Ethan's only 11, uh but he's already like he's got the FOMO going and, and wants like a phone I'm like dude we're going to have to have multiple conversations about this before we, you know, move in that direction. So I was like, it's not completely off the table, but you know, I'm like telling him about the brick phone and like, you know, how uh, maybe we start with just text message and, and calls only. And, you know, it's just like this whole can of uh, Pandora's box that we're going to open. So Ethan has, know, has a phone now? Ethan has no. a phone? No, 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 he doesn't. Like oh. his, his whole thing was like, "I'll get straight A's, and then I can have a phone." And I'm like, oh, "Okay, you know, like that's that's a cool thing to say, um, <laughs> you know." But no, it, it, show me, you know, and then we'll have a conversation about it. But yeah, it was just like I didn't realize it was already at uh, this point where phones are are all his friends like are starting to kind of I was going to say like, what what age right them. now is it is it most common practice for a, a by the kid? time the kids are 13 everybody has one yeah, yeah. Th- 13 and see, that's, all the friends have it that makes more sense and, and so he was trying to I'm like okay so which one of your friends has a phone and then he names like two of them and they're totally like they're, they're totally the kids that like their dad let them watch Walking Dead you know when they're in <laughs> kindergarten and I'm like yeah no that's not a good example. <laughs> yeah. You know, like they're not doing a good job. Yeah. How do you tell so, your kid, no, that dad's a loser. We're not going to yeah, use that it. That dad's a loser we'll and parent. that kid has issues. So we're not going to use that as an example. Like, so, okay, wait, 13, you are seventh grade. Is that seventh grade? So junior, so junior high is kind of the, yeah, the standard. High. Yeah. And then when the kids get it, is it, for the most part, free for all, they can download whatever apps they want, or is it? Do they do like the brick phone, where it's like the Nokia type of deal, where well, all they can do is call and? I think it's free button the text. iPhone. Like, it, yeah, it's it's mind boggling to me. But again, like I said, like I think there's just some parents who are just like, like they don't put a whole lot of thought uh, behind just allowing these kids access to these things. And yeah. how old is Ethan right now? Eleven. Okay, so he's still got. Is that, is that the plan for you then? Thirteen. I mean, what's the what's your guys' strategy? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to hold out as long as possible, but I don't want to like be super rigid about it either, um, because I know it's an inevitable, right? Uh, so I'm just trying to kind of make sure that we keep having conversations about each one of these and creating boundaries around certain things and now, certain apps and you can put paren- search. You can put parental controls and stuff uh, on the phones that are pretty good. The only problem I have is that kids are way more tech savvy than their parents right. typically. So you'll you'll put these parental controls and I think the kids They'll talk. They'll figure it out. And they talk yeah. with each other. 
you know, and yeah. oh, you got that. Oh, this is what you do, and then type this instead, and then you'll get around it. That's what I. That's what I imagine. You know? Well, I remember. Yeah. I do remember Enzo telling us about this. That like, what's common practice for kids, your guys' kids' ages, is uh, to have like a, a ghost account on all their stuff. So like, mom and dad can yeah. see. There, so your their Facebook, their Instagram, or whatever you know, Snapchat, whatever they have. There's like the the one that mom and dad can see. Yeah, pictures then, with mom and dad. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then there's like the one they really use with all their friends. That's is, is, so that's probably now. Okay, the kids don't have their phone, but do they have? Does do they have Facebook and do they have Snapchat yet, or does that is that all at the no, same time? No, no, no. I, they they probably have iPads. Is no, that, no, that stuff. Yeah, iPads. Yeah, they're they're. I mean, they have Roblox and they can communicate with their friends on there. Uh, but yeah, you, it's mainly just on video games where they can chat and hang out with their buddies. But we monitor that anyways. Yeah, so that's what my daughter does. She gets she gets on with Roblox and they can talk with their friends and stuff. But we'll go on there and look and see what's going on. But you can there's a mm -hmm. there's a point when you can tell in my experience where your kid is they're at the age where if something kind of iffy happens. They, they have to tell you, you know, like, oh, I have to tell you what happened. You know, one of my friends said something. And then all of a sudden they reach that age where they don't tell you anymore, you know. All of a sudden it's like, you know, the, the communication yeah. stops. That's when it gets a little a little scary. Yeah, but, I feel like I this know. is so far ahead of me right now. Like, I don't think about this. Bro, by the time your kid's old enough, oh, yeah. he's going to have no, a computer it's... chip in his brain or something weird. Oh, God, don't say that. <laughs> That's weird shit. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Weird. The new standard will be like when he's five. Yeah. Like, he'll have to have a full... Like, I mean, it's, it's got to be face. such a, a challenge for parents when because it, it, there's the part there, I think everybody, you, you want to try and... You know, I don't want to say control, but you want to try and monitor or you know shield them for so, from so much stuff. But then at the same time, too, you also don't want your kid to be the one kid who's at school. Everybody is able to communicate on Facebook and do these things this like that. This is how they, this is how they the talk to each other. Wait, but yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. that's how they communicate. Yeah. And then you're the parent who says you can't have that. Dude, you know what's funny is I was watching. Do you guys remember the movie Stand By Me? Mm -hmm. Great yeah. movie, right? Yeah, so I hadn't seen it in a long time. I watched it last night uh, with Jessica. And it's depicted in 1959. And you realize, and you know, from, I mean, even when we were kids, there was so much less parental oversight yeah. when we were kids. Mm -hmm. Like in the movie, Stand By Me, these kids are hanging out in their tree, you know, house, they're playing. Nobody knows what the fuck they're doing. Parents have no idea. All they know is Timmy's going to come back when the sun goes down. And from now until then, who knows what he's doing. It was like yep. that when we were kids too. So it's you know the challenges are always have always been there. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess they're just different they're just now. different. Yeah, they they're, change. Yeah, because I mean, think about that. When you were a kid, like that's I know how, I know where my were. kids are at every second, and I could call yeah. I could call my son any minute, and I know I can get a hold of him. And well, that's him. the that, that's the irony, right? Is like they could go, you could send them off, and they could go explore and all that kind of stuff. And now you actually can track them if they did have like a watch or a phone. It's like you could GPS locate them, you know, whereas, and, so, and we're still more nervous about letting them do that now than, than we were back in the day. Oh, dude. We I, had no idea. No idea. My parents had no idea. Yeah, I could have right. been dead yeah. for hours and nobody would have known until, you know, I didn't show up for dinner or whatever. No, that's how it was for us. Yeah. Was it was when the sun comes down. I mean, I could literally just take off on my bike and go as far as I could pretty much ride my bike. There wasn't like a, 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 as long as you were back by sun. And that's, I'd get in trouble for that. And you know, what's funny as a kid, you push that all the time. Oh, like, oh, the sun's still up. I'm not, I'm not going in yet. And then you get home and you come racing in as the sun's going well, down. Well, as we're watching the movie, Jessica now, cause she's a mom now, right? She's like getting emotional and, she, and I'm like, what's the matter? And she goes, I'm starting to get like anxious and stressed out because I have a son and I, I know how boys are and, and this and that. And I, I remember when I was 12, 13, 14 off on my own. I mean, the, some of the dangerous, you know, you don't know you're a kid. You just do dangerous shit. But man, we did some shit that I think about, you know, riding our bikes down hills that, you know, there's no trail and kids falling off their bikes and shooting fire you know, works at each other and, you know, throwing rocks oh. at each other and just crazy shit that, you know, if I saw my kids do, I'd be like, you're grounded for a year at least, you know? <laughs> I know. We, just, we, we've had moments of that recently too. Even when we were down at that gymnastic thing, like there was a bonfire that, Everybody got invited to near Pismo, and there was one of those lifeguard towers there that, you know, some of the older kids and then, of course, you know, my kids get drawn in because, like, oh, this is cool and dangerous. Like, they all climbed on top of it, and they're standing on top of this thing. And then one of the kids, because he's all, you know, gymnastic, 
amazing. He did this like backflip off of it and landed and, and we're just like, Courtney, and I look over and the kids are on top of it and we're like, Hey, <laughs> like get down from there. You know, and I didn't want to embarrass them in front of all these like older kids, but I'm like, like, no, like you're going to get hurt. Oh. But it's just one of those things. Like it's, it's, it's a natural inclination to, to, to seek out like, you know, risky stuff and, and challenge yourself. Especially young boys, especially with your friends, you know, your friends are always daring you to do shit and you just end up doing the worst, stupidest stuff yeah. of all time. So. Oh, speaking of that, did you see they're doing another jackass uh, what? movie? Yeah. With the so same guys? Like, yeah. So there's like a trailer coming out and uh, what what drew me into it was they, they brought, I think it's Francis Naganu, the, um, the one of the like hardest hardest puncher yeah, UFC in the fighter. world. Yeah, UFC champion, right? So they got him in the movie to punch one of the guys in the nuts as hard as he possibly could oh, wow. punch. And and they like filmed it, right? And he kind of let off a little bit and they were like, no, you got to go full force, you know? And he, and he was all like, have you already had children? You know, and he was like <laughs> trying to be all respectful about it. <laughs> like she was all worried that... He was going to ruin, you know, his legacy. He's like, I want to make sure, you know, that's all good before I do this. Now, haven't have half guys are all old, dude. Well, yeah, haven't half those guys, too. Like, I think, didn't want one died, and then, then there's, like, what, yeah. re, then rehab, yeah, and lost all their money. Died. Like, yeah. yeah, aren't they all a mess? Yeah, I think John, Steve-O's the only one that's still kind of, like, Johnny Steve-O's Knoxville doing looks stand like up and, yeah, I don't know what Johnny Knoxville's doing, but he hasn't been in many movies in a while, no, so no, it's and, interesting. I wonder. And he looks like, the last time I saw Johnny Knoxville, he kind of comes across like he he's hit his head too many times or like something's not right. So I don't know what these guys oh, are going to do. They, dude, they all have a screw loose. Let's be honest. Yeah, totally. That's why I think it'll be, it'll be, I don't know. I, I like watching those movies just cause it, it kind of brings out that junior high kid in me. Like <laughs> you want to like watch somebody do something really stupid. I uh, get some amusement out of it, but yeah, they were like the, the masters at that dude. I was like, what, what are these guys going to think of next? It's yeah, you, pretty crazy. You know what's funny is that every group of guys, tell me guys, tell me if this is true or not for you guys. Every group of guys, there's that one guy that's the guy that'll do anything. Yeah, yeah. I had that. There was yep. a, a buddy of mine that was like that where we were even af- we would even be afraid to tell him to do something because we know he would do it. Like yeah. we, he would do anything. We'd say like eat that piece of dog crap and he would do it or you know, ju- jump off the jump off the hill and roll down, and, and he would do it. Or ride your bike, in, you know, against traffic. So we wouldn't say things on purpose because the yeah. guy would end up. You guys had a buddy like oh, that yeah. too. Oh, yeah. oh, we talked one of my friends into taking one of those like high powered airsoft guns and like shooting his nut point blank. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why, dude? Why? And he had like this crazy bruise for like months. Oh. <laughs> This is I just a male thing too, it. though, right? Girls don't do anything. No, like this. they don't do There's this. Nothing dude. like this. They're way smarter than we are. <laughs> and and it's yeah. and it's funny because the guy that does this stupid shit always ranks highly among all the friends. Oh, f- Tommy, oh, oh, yeah. anything, bro, he's cool. Yeah. Yeah. He's crazy. <laughs> he's crazy. Yeah, he's crazy. Don't yeah. fuck with Tommy. He's crazy man. <laughs> yeah, probably in jail now or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Justin, I want to ask you. I know as of the filming of this uh, tomorrow, you're doing your the talk with the trainers with NCI. Right? Yeah. Is that tomorrow? How'd you, how's your guys' experience? We've all done them now, right? Well, we've yeah. talked to the I've trainers. only done one so far. Yeah. How's your guys' experience with it so far? I've enjoyed it so far. I think that um, it, the, the questions are interesting. I'm always curious as to what people want to know. Uh, and a lot of it is is around personal training and how I structured uh, my business. And, you know, it's kind of cool because we all have different ways that we handled that. Uh, in our careers. And so we dove into that a bit last time. So I'm curious to see what they're going to bring up this time uh, in terms of like uh, bringing value to, to that. And then also like, you know, it's just cool because they all are very, very growth minded and, and really absorb, uh, you know, whatever advice you're, you're kind of giving out. Now, did you, I know last time you knew what you were going into. Do you know this time? No, it's going to be more of just a Q and a. So, um, it, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of at the whim to see what, what questions come my way and see if I can answer them the best possible. So Yeah, the, 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 the quality that NCI is producing, I, it feels like they're doing a really good job. I, just the questions I get from the trainers in this particular – so what's happening, for people who don't know, 
is there's this, uh, it's like a course, right? And you sign up for it as a trainer or coach. And it includes uh, lots of training and coaching from very successful, experienced trainers, right? One of them being Jason Phillips, who runs NCI, who obviously was a very successful coach himself and runs a successful certification uh, business. Um, and then this one we're a part of. And so you have all these trainers on there and they ask you questions or there's a particular topic. And the questions I'm getting asked shows me that these are trainers that are going to be really good or that are really good. So I like, I like it. It makes me feel really good because, I mean, earlier in the episode, we were talking about obesity and whatever. This is a big problem. And I, the, the people best equipped, I'm not saying that we'll fix it, but the best chance comes from the fitness industry. The best chances of fixing this comes from what is coaches. The, what has been the, the growth in our space as far as coaches and trainers? Is it still, uh, I know it was on the rise for a while. I haven't looked at that statistic in a long time. Do either one of you know? The last time I, I, I looked. It's, it's, I think it's still growing, yeah, yeah yep. which surprised me. It, the last um, time I looked, it's the one segment of the fitness industry that continues to grow uh, year over year. So the, the number of trainers and the awareness around hiring a trainer and a coach. I wonder if that's still on that on that path with everything that's happened in the last two years. I, I would like speculate that it that it is, and I, I think it's because this is my guess. I guess that online coaching has grown so much that that's made up the difference. That yeah. more people now are hiring people to work with them virtually than ever before. And finding value. In I used to think it was kind of a joke and a, and a terrible idea, but it, just with technology, you've been able to, I mean, we've come so far with it, the ability to connect with people and to be able to connect them with resources and apps that you can use to, to coach. It's really evolved that space. I mean, what it was just five years ago, I feel like you couldn't really provide a pretty good service, but I mean, it's it's a lot different today than what it was. Then. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, and the way that they focus, you know, what they focus on at NCI is the right stuff. Like they focus on the Behavior coaching, stuff, yeah, behaviors yeah. and the coaching aspect, yeah. which is the most important. I remember that was the thing that we connected with Jason the most. Remember when we all first met? That was the, do you, the what he was talking. Well, about. what I like about it too is we do a lot of uh, we cover a lot of topics on the show, but this helps to kind of narrow it down to very specifics, like even like price point uh, that and how I worked my way through that with charging sessions. And, you know, just more of like the exact details of like what I did in my personal training business specifically. So it's kind of fun to revisit all that stuff. Yeah. Do you know, do you guys know Jason, what kind of coach or how he coached when he used to do that? Do you guys know what he used to do? Are you asking him because you know the answer? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> when he was, <laughs> I don't know if you guys knew this, right? So when he, you know, before he started NCI and, and, and training other trainers, he was a very successful online coach himself. And his value proposition was that you could get a hold of him at any time, 24 hours a day. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. he would coach you through whatever, which which is an insane uh, commitment from a coach. But I could see the value in that. You imagine yeah. as a client, yeah. like, oh, man, I'm going to eat this thing. And he's, oh, you know, boom, he's right there. Send me a picture. Let me help you out. Or, oh, man. Yeah, I it sets like you apart. That's totally a distinctive uh, selling point. Yeah, and it, it made him really uh, successful. But I mean, what a commitment! That's a that's a lot of work. I mean, I did the I did something similar. I, did, I don't think I made that big of a deal about saying it like that. But I was in daily communication with all my coaching clients. Um, that because that's I saw the opportunity there. Right, the, yeah. the the other the other coaches in the space at the time were all about volume, like how many people they could get in, like you know, coaching right. 50, once a week check ins. And then yeah, like, and coaching fifty people, and that's how they made revenue. Where I thought I'd rather limit myself to how many people I coach, but give a like supreme service. Mm -hmm. And also knowing that it's so nuanced that, you know, from training and coaching clients in person for so many years, you just know that, you know, there's always questions. There's always things that they want more details and explanations. So instead of giving everybody more generic cookie cutter stuff and trying to go the volume route, I went more of a high service route and did the same thing yeah. where I was in constant communication. Hey, speaking of sponsors, I forgot to tell you guys, when I was up at the in Truckee with uh, Jessica's friends, after about a day, everybody comes to me and they go, what's with this public goods? Because, you know, the house is all yeah. outfitted with everything. Yeah, it's all, yeah. Yeah, public goods soap and shampoo and conditioner and toothpaste and whatever. So I explained it to them and, you know, it's like, well, it's it's good for the environment. It's less expensive company we work with. And uh, so then they were super impressed. I've, I think they're gonna start I've fully up. converted my houses. Uh, there's not much I have left that's not public goods. I mean, as far as like everything from the laundry detergent to the, the dryer sheets to the 
It's the surface cleaning spray, which is my favorite, like the lavender, like for the countertops. Uh, even the bars of soap was the last one, right? Because we uh, we used to work with what's their face? I can't even think of the name of the company right now. And then I was doing their soap for the longest time. But public goods soap is freaking like a quarter of the price. Yeah. And it's freaking just as just as good as soap. And so I've gotten that now. My toothpaste, like my whole house is. A, I like too the the branding. I I, I think the whole uniform. Like, yeah, just like yes. simple, simplistic. Yeah, yeah, I think that I like that style of just just like simple and clean, the white and black like that. So no, I've fully converted over to all their stuff. There, are, there do other things though. weren't were, weren't you guys talking about something else that was on there? I didn't even know. Was it food? Was yeah, it? Yeah, they have some food products. They have dog food. products. Yeah, I haven't yeah, dabbled in the food stuff. Everything I do right now is like all cleaning, cleaning and 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 products like that for the house. But I haven't messed with food yet. Didn't they? Wasn't it tuna or something? When you yeah, guys there's some saying? canned foods you can it's get, like boxed and canned items. Yeah, yeah, I think you can get olive oil, nuts. nuts. I know they have nuts. Yeah, stuff that's got you know kind of a long shelf life, but that's not like heavily processed. Uh, you'll find, uh, you know, on their site. So, you know, pretty good stuff. All right. Uh, one more thing I want to talk about, a study that I thought you guys would be very interested in. So uh, are you guys a grower or a shower? <laughs> <laughs> they actually did a study on this. This is very revealing. They, right. did, they did a study on what makes someone a grower versus what makes someone a shower. Really? Yeah, they studied like, <laughs> like 200 men. And like they, it's not a genetic I, I've heard it also called like, Meat cock or blo uh, blood cock? But, so that's, which is, <laughs> wow, that's new. To I me. mean, wow, that's what I—that's what somebody said. Interesting, Doug. Can you look that up real quick? Uh, look up meat. <laughs> <laughs> Almost got him right there. Almost got me. Look up meat cock versus blood cock. Let's see what the difference is. Uh, <laughs> hey, you imagine he starts to type it, it populates automatically. So okay, wait. So it's not oh, all genetics. No, so no. What I mean is, like, what makes okay? So here's what they did. They did this study where they took men. Well, what makes it is what that means is somebody who is the by the amount they grow. After yes, the, yeah, they've been. So erect. a grower is somebody where when they're flaccid and then they get an erection, there's a big difference, right? Yeah. A shower yeah. is someone who, when they're flaccid versus erect, there's not as big of a difference. Now, what's the percentage of the population? That's the thing. Well, no, they didn't show that. Oh. Most people are growers. The vast majority yeah. of people are growers, according to the study. It's like a magic trick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, trust me. It grows. Yeah. He, so what they would do with the study is they used, I think it was MRI, but they, they imaged them flaccid, and then they injected their penises with this this compound that gives you this automatic erection, no matter what. And, it, it, and they said in the study... Maximum erection was the word that they used, which is kind of interesting. Erection. I didn't even know there was a drug like that, right? You just uh -huh. boop, boop, yeah. there's a boner. And what they found was the difference was, on average, a man's flaccid penis will grow an inch and a half to become erect. If it grows more than that, then you're a grower. If it's less than that, then you're a shower. So an inch and a half or so, that's the number. So if it grows more than that, <laughs> grower, less than that, shower. So I don't know if you guys, I thought you guys like science, that. Yeah. you guys. <laughs> hey, hey, here's what's funny. Who funds shit like this? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I feel like it's like a, like a college, a college like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I feel like it's like a college thing. Check your penis with this um, <laughs> erection Come, dude. saline. It, it's always college aged men. Come on, dude. They're like, listen, we'll give you free lunch. We'll pay you 20 bucks and we'll give you yeah. a boner. I'll We're going to hammer eye your dick. <laughs> no big deal. I'll yeah. sign up for that. No problem. <laughs> It's just, it, some of these, it makes me laugh because it's like the researchers are sitting around and like, all right, you know, what we, we got some ideas for what we're going to study. Like, all right, John, you said like the cure for cancer. Okay. That's good. Uh, you know, this new compound that might solve heart disease. That's another one. Oh, grower versus shower. No, I totally Let's feel- Let's spend money on I that. I totally feel like it's like a, a college senior project thing. And tell me that's not something that you wouldn't think of as a as a kid in school. In like, class? Totally. Everybody come up with a study. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. I, 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 you're always comparing yourself. Yeah. yeah. Well, well like, and also- a study I mean, about this. You think it'd be hilarious to do that, right? It's just like one of those that's things- That's like such a good theory. I could totally see of that. Of course. Right? Uh, I, I, mean, I, that is my, I mean, that would be my guess. That's how a lot of these studies that are like ridiculous yeah. like this. Hi, my, my name is Justin Andrews, and today I'm presenting my study on silent but deadly. Is yeah. it true? Yeah. I don't know. We'll find out. I did it. I studied yeah, 300 let's, guys. Let's study this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Dude, I do have one more thing to, to uh, if, if you get time and you want you want a, uh, something that's kind of trippy to look at, check out Zoom Quilt. It's like a website that has this... I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but it's like a zoom in kind of perspective art where the art just kind of keeps coming at you almost like you're at a concert. 
it, they have a couple of these where you just literally stare at it and it's the trippiest thing you've ever seen are you I talking about i the, stared at it for like 20 minutes are you talking about the ones where it's like all the dots and then if you look and then it turns into something when you like that no. well it's all drawn there's like all these like cool environments and then it just keeps you keep the, the perspective like right in the middle and you just keep like, you know i've never been in. able to do those no, no, no! It's so, oh, dude, it's so, it's so cool. frustrating it's for me. Wait, 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 wait! Okay, you're talking about two different things. So. Yeah, I, yeah. He's talking about a, a a still image. I'm talking about a video. Yeah, it's no, like I, a video I know. That's yeah, like this pulling you. This right here. I know exactly what you're talking about. Like it, it keeps zooming in, and there keeps there's there's more and more and more, and it doesn't stop, which is kind of yeah. weird. Um, it's a it's a good time now, but it's it, it it'll trip you out. Yeah, now sure. and now, that's cool. Now, Adam, you're talking about those, that's on a quilt. No, I think that's it's called name. it's called uh, Zoom Quilt is the name of the website. Yeah. Now you're talking about Adam are those posters that were really popular? Yeah. I like want to say the, in the 90s. Yeah, it was like the 90s where it looks like nothing. Yeah. But then if you look yeah. at it a certain way, an image will pop out. Yeah. You, you haven't. Been you able to you do remember Mall Rats? I've <laughs> never been able. I've never been able to do those. I can help you do that. I have I people swear. have all yeah. told me that you get your you gotta look over here in the corner, let your eyes blur. Like yeah, I've, relax I've, heard, your I've eyes. looked up yeah. all the shit. And I've tried it a hundred times. I can't do it. Really? Yeah. What if everybody's lying to you? Nobody could do it. Yes. <laughs> you can't see it, bro. That's no, weird. there was a there was a while there. I believe that you. for a while I was like, oh, this is like one of those big pranks. You know, what I'm saying that everybody's just in on, and I'm not. You know, so but no, it's I've never been able to do it. Oh yeah, yeah. I can do it right away now. I practiced a lot. No, it pisses kid. me off too. Yeah. I, every time I see one of those, I'm like, God. You know damn. what you got to do? You hold the page up. I know, face, bro. Three inches slowly, from your nose. You slowly, you slowly pull. I've tried all the shit, dude. You're not going to tell me something really? I haven't heard already. Yes. It wasn't like I tried it one time. That was popular for like a decade. I know. Yeah. And they had yeah. a store you're, in the- You literally are the guy from Mallrats, where he's, the whole movie, he starts and staring at this one thing. He's like, can't see it. <laughs> and he gets all pissed off. <laughs> I, like, I, I, I get so mad, man. I, there, was a, there was a store in the mall. I remember as a kid, we used to go to it all the time. And, and my buddy's like, oh yeah, that one's this and this. And Look I'm, at the dolphin. Yeah, oh, yeah. I can't see none. I can't see none of them. <laughs> Never. Yeah. Never been able to work for me. Hey, real quick, I hope you're enjoying this episode. Head over to mindpumpfree.com. Check out some of our guides. One guide in particular is really cool. It talks about how to get a better squat. So if you want to do full range of motion squats to develop better muscles, get better function, you want to do it without pain, with better ankle mobility, go to mindpumpfree.com and check out our How to Squat Like a Pro guide. All right, enjoy the rest of the show. All right, our first question is from Trey Freeman. What is a way I can improve on dips? Oh, body weight dips. One of the best muscle building exercises for the upper body. It doesn't get as enough, uh, I think, accolades or attention like pull-ups do, but dips are excellent for the shoulders, triceps, and the chest. But of course, because it's your body weight, they can be pretty hard. The advice that I'll give to get better on dips, you can apply to any exercise. And, uh, and then we'll get to more, I guess, more nuanced advice. But generally speaking, practice them every single day. Not work out with them every single day. So you're not trying to pump out as many reps as you can and get sore. But rather, you know, when you have a, a dip apparatus in your home or set up nearby, several times a day, four times a day, when you walk by it, do, let's say you could do max six dips, do like two and just practice over and over again, getting good at them. And your strength improves so quickly when you apply this frequency uh, principle to yeah. pretty much any exercise. You know, I, one I, thing I, go ahead, one thing I noticed, um, is the shoulder mobility is an issue for a lot of people. And, and you find, um, you know, a lot of pain sometimes with people that pre like prevents them from even mm -hmm. attempting dips. Uh, so that's something to consider and address shoulder mobility, uh, to be able to put you in a, in, a, in a good postural position while attempting them because the real benefit that I've found is really trying to achieve full range of motion, uh, you know, with that exercise and, and really be able to express that uh, depth. Uh, so uh, that's something that I know that um, a lot of times that's, that's probably one of the first things that deters people from even uh, doing dips is that it, they get pain in the shoulder. I'd say the advice is almost identical to the advice that we just recently gave about improving your pull-ups. Um, there is one thing that I did different, though, in comparison to the pull-ups. because I, So I, I think I brought this up not that long ago on the show. I, the first time I remember uh, going to a gym and my buddy hopping up and doing, I don't know, he pumped out like 10 or 15 dips real quick. 
And then uh, I jumped up to do it. I couldn't even do one. Mm -hmm. So I was extremely weak. And something I did with that that I, I didn't really do with pull-ups that actually helped me were uh, isometric holds at the bottom and the top. Yes. Because I was so yes. weak that I couldn't even do one full one. So I would get in position all the way down real deep, and then I would just hold my body weight up as long as I could I could hold it there, and then reset, and then do it again. I'd do that three or four times, and then I'd do it at the top of the rep. So I'd get myself positioned up where I was almost completely locked out, and then I would do an isometric hold at the top. Same thing again for, for time, and then reset and do that four or five times. Uh, that helped, uh, and that's something different that I didn't do with pull-ups. Pull-ups, I never really use uh, isometrics as a strategy to improve my pull-ups, uh, but I did do that with dips, and I did notice, and I, I'm assuming that a lot of it does have to do with what you just alluded to, Justin, which is the range of motion and, and just having strength and control down there. Yeah, especially I mean, at the bottom. Yeah, how often yeah. are you ever in, in a position like that? Mm -hmm. And so I think I was just so weak in that position that just getting in that position and then holding that position for an extended period of time and then trying to progress the time that I was doing the isometric hold did enough to build some strength there that I could actually get in and out of that. Totally. And if you're really strong and you want to get even stronger at dips, you could do that with weight. So Waited, you could, yes. Yeah, and, so, and, and just a few reps. I was going to mention that too. Exactly. So you could literally strap a dumbbell around your waist and do an isometric hold at the top with a weight that you wouldn't be able to do a rep with, but you could hold yourself. So you jump up in a position, hold yourself, you know, for 15 seconds or 20 seconds. What a great way to get stronger. And then if you're on the other end of the scale and you can't even do one dip and it's very challenging for you to even do one besides isometrics at the top, which if you, most people who can't do a dip can at least hold themselves at the top. But if all that's too challenging, what you do is you take resistance bands and put them around the bars so that it goes between both bars. Then you use knee a chair top. or a ladder. Yeah. And then you put your knee on top of it or your foot on top of it so that it's assisting you. When you do dips every single day to practice them and get stronger, you want the intensity to be not so high because you can't work out every single day but you can't practice them every day. So the band assistance becomes uh, more valuable. So you have the band, you put your knees on it or your foot and then do, you know, do, you know, three, four reps throughout the whole day. Every time you walk by, yeah. do a few reps. And I swear it, it will blow you away at how fast you get stronger when you practice something frequently. The first time I did this, it was almost like I thought something was right. I, I did this with bench press. Uh, one time because I wanted my bench press to get up higher and a trainer did, you know, talk me into doing this. And I remember practicing with a light, with a, you know, moderate load by the end of the week, I was like, wait a minute. I feel like I'm way stronger just within a week. Yeah. And I, I think this, this seems like a common knowledge and everybody would know to do this, but also too, like, you know, these dip bars will, will narrow forward so you can actually like scoot forward and get a more narrow grip versus like out in the wide i remember having to explain that to a few people actually that uh, you know had issues because you know the bars were set too wide for them uh you know to consider if that's an issue to kind of scoot forward and get a more of a narrow uh grip with that yeah but it's it's one exercise that i think uh like pull-ups it's such a, a staple movement and if you get good at them you get really good upper body development from yeah. from doing dips. I don't and I don't see enough people incorporate them in their routine. At least not like pull-ups. Like everybody does pull-ups. Not everybody does dips, but I definitely think it should be up there. Next question is from Mo Strength Gains. What are the benefits of elevating the heels in a squat? Is it ever preferential versus working on ankle mobility? Now, there's two reasons why someone will elevate their heels. One is because their ankle mobility prevents them from doing a good full squat. And so they remedy the problem, or should I say put a bandaid on the problem by elevating their heels a little bit. So squat shoes will do this a little bit, uh, or you'll see people will put, back in the day they used to use like a two by four, they would put under their heels. So that's one reason. The other reason is you may have great ankle mobility. You may not have an issue squatting with a full squat with good control and that stuff, but you still may want to elevate your heels sometimes because doing so, places more emphasis on the quads. You can actually take an exercise like a squat. I love to do this. And elevate your heels. And now because of the way that it, it, it changes your, your center of gravity, it keeps you more upright. 
you're going to get more knee extension, right? And you'll get more quad focus. Um, and yeah, I, I do this spe sometimes specifically for that because I want to feel it more in my quads. Well, I mean, that's how I do it now. I mean, if, I, if you see my heels elevated, the intent is that I just want put more <sighs> emphasis on the quads and just get like a, a massive quad pump from it. It's not a bad strategy when teaching a client to when, who you know they lack the ankle mobility, but you want to teach them good depth and range of motion oh, on yeah. the squat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I used to do it for that, right? So if I had a client who has had limiting ankle mobility, but I wanted them to get all the way down in a deep squat and practice that full range of motion i'd get them there and then i would explain why i have your heels elevated and why you're able to get down like the reason why we can't get all the way down mm -hmm. without me doing this is because you lack the ankle mobility so the goal is for us to get to a place where we could do that so i mean it's a it's a it's a it's a tool it's another tool that you can yeah. use in the gym and there's there's value to it i think the thing that you just got to be careful of is i, I there was a trend for a, a quite a while there where uh, people were doing that because it was the only way they could squat. They yeah. couldn't. They couldn't mm -hmm. squat past ninety degrees without elevating their heels, and so they would they would elevate the heels just so they could get down. And I think there's nothing wrong with that, so long as you're using it as a tool and not a crutch. Yeah, I like to do the same and just use that as a reveal uh, to show that they can actually achieve that depth. And then from there, it's it's work alongside that in terms of uh, being able to address the ankle mobility and then start scaling down uh, the height, uh, you know, of that platform. Um, and so, you know, I've used that as a tool as well to kind of, uh, you know, gradually progress them down towards full range of motion. Yeah, a few of my favorite <clears throat> heel ed elevated quad exercises are front squats with the heels elevated goblet squats that one adam showed me um with mm -hmm. heels elevated which was man i got a crazy pump that's a great one from doing that and then safety bar squats because the safety bar is obviously so much higher so it already encourages you have more kind of an upright posture and then i'll elevate my heels and man i tell you i get such a great quad pump in fact for people who have an imbalance or let's say they want to work on their aesthetics and their quads just aren't developing this is a little bit more rare, but sometimes people, they'll, they'll do squats and stuff and their butt will grow, but their quads don't really respond. Um, try doing a lot of these squat movements with your heels elevated. You would be, it, it, it completely, in my opinion, it completely changes the feel of the exercise oh, and yeah. really gets it, you know, squarely on the quads. As far as the ankle mobility is concerned, you know, the goal should be to achieve, a, be able to achieve a good squat with your feet not needing or your ankles not needing a crutch uh, with, you know, your heels being elevated because that's your most natural position, right, is to be barefoot. So you want to be able to do it barefoot without having to elevate your heels. So if you if you need to elevate your heels, then you should definitely spend some time working on ankle mobility because you'd be better off being able to do it without having your heels elevated. And then you elevate your heels if you just want to change the exercise. Next question is from Nick Folkman. What exercise helps improve knee pain and functionality? You know, back in the day, I would focus on the knee joint whenever somebody had issues with the knee joint. So that someone would tell me, oh, my knees hurt when I squat or, you know, when I lunge and I would look at the IT band and I would look at you know, the knee function and okay, you know, did you get any imaging done? Is there chondromalacia the, under the kneecap and blah, blah, blah. Hips and ankle. Later on, exactly. Later on, it really, I started to figure out that it had way more to do with the ankle and hips than it did with the knee. Because the knee joint, I mean, it bends and it extends. That's it. it. Doesn't It doesn't rotate. It doesn't bend laterally. I mean, it's got ligaments in there actually to prevent it from doing anything other than flexing and extending. But the ankle moves all kinds of different directions. The foot moves in lots of different directions, you know, not, not even just the ankle, just the foot. And so does the hip. So if the ankle and the hip and the foot lack strength and stability in any of the directions that the knee doesn't move, then all that support is going straight to those ligaments in the knee right. that prevent it from doing that. And then you start Just to think, develop. Think oh. about how much pressure the knee is taking on constantly with gravitational forces going straight down. Um, you know, where's the weak link in the kinetic chain? Uh, you know, it's going to take on a lot of that stress. And now if, if it's taking on a lot of those, it's not tracking properly, like any little 
thing is is isn't um you know you don't have proper mobility in your ankles or your hips aren't rotating like they normally could and the knee has to kind of adjust to that uh it's going to add all that excess of pressure to an already uh stressed out joint now there's obviously there's value in building all the muscles that surround the knee right so your quads and hamstrings and your calves like having strong muscles that are around your knee support the knee too so there's there's tremendous value i remember when uh, I tore my ACL and MCL, and the doctor was so blown away on the, how stable I still was, even without with with losing those those ligaments. Yep. But that was because of all the muscle that I had developed around it. So there's obvious uh, value in building the muscles around. But when I think of clients that would complain of of knee problems. Uh, to your point, Sal, yeah, it's it's almost always related to poor, you know, hip mobility and or ankle mobility, and then the the knee is just carrying all the stress. And so that's the first place that I go now. If someone complains about their knee, is we're going to look right away to the hips and the ankle and address there. Nine out of ten times, nine out of ten times is what yeah. I find uh, the issue. I mean, think about it this way: you know, there's a submission in jujitsu called a heel hook where somebody takes your they have they trap your leg and then they hook around your your essentially your heel and then they twist your leg and it looks like you're attacking the foot but the reality is the the joint that gets damaged in a heel hook is the knee because imagine this for a second so here's the knee joint right and the knee joint flexes and extends that's it and there are things that prevent it from twisting and sliding and bending laterally and let's say somebody grabs your ankle and starts to twist your leg to the outside. Well, if, what's going to happen is your hip is going to allow your leg to twist. But what happens when the hip runs out of room? Let's say you're too tight and you can't twist anymore. Well, now the pressure's going to the knee. A lot more torque. Yep. Right on the knee, and it's the meniscus holding things together, but that can only do so much, and then the meniscus eventually tears or gets strained. So when you have knee problems and knee pain, it's almost always, in my experience, because your hips and your ankles just aren't doing what they're supposed to. I mean, the kneecap tracks, supposed to track nicely in this groove. Well, if it's always pushing to the side uh, laterally because your hips aren't doing what they're supposed to, your ankles aren't doing what they're supposed to, well, now your kneecap is tracking kind of weird. Maybe at first you don't feel any pain, but you work out this way, you walk this way, you go on hikes. Next thing you know, you're like, man, my knee always bothers me. Like, what the hell's going on? Then you go to the doctor. They do some imaging and they go, oh, the bottom of your kneecap, it's all chewed up. We need to go in there and clean it up. So they go in there and they clean up all the pieces or whatever and you feel a little better, but you never fix the root cause. And so then you end up with the same problem again and then eventually you have to get a knee replacement or whatever. So it's all about the surrounding joints that are way more mobile than the knee joint. And if they don't have the support and strength, your knee joint, all those ligaments and tendons and all that cartilage is holding itself together. But over time, you end up developing uh, lots of problems well, and inflammation. And a lot of times you'll feel, you'll feel this in your IT. And this is where I didn't fully grasp this as a trainer when I first, I, I thought, oh, this I have these knots in my IT that's, and the yeah. IT, IT runs in the front of the patella. And so when I would foam roll the IT, it would relieve the knee and then my knee wouldn't yep. bother me. And so I, I, I blamed it on the IT all the time. And then I'd get clients that would, oh, it's your IT, it's your IT. And, you know, and then I'd foam roll them and then they'd feel relief and they'd be like, oh, wow, you know, and so I thought I was addressing the issue, but what was happening was I, all I really was doing was giving them a little bit of instant relief. And the reason why their IT was so tight was because of the lack of mobility and strength and control in the hip. It was doing what it was supposed to do. It was protecting, That's right. uh, you know, the joints. So, That's right. Yeah. Your body's smart with that stuff. And, and uh, yeah, you have to trace it back to the root. Uh, and this is why it's important to have standards in, in terms of alignment and uh, an optimal alignment so your joint can travel the way it's supposed to. Uh, so to be able to find your way back to that optimal alignment position is something that, you know, we should always kind of be looking at. Yeah, no, great point. And what we need to understand is that our joints really, we, we evolved or were designed to last you a lifetime. So, you know, what does that mean? What that means is when you do things properly, right? So although our, our bodies are kind of like machines, they're actually a little different than machines. A machine, if you use it over and over again, you start to get wear and tear over time. Well, the human bodies, there's this interesting dichotomy going on where when you move a joint, but you do it right and you strengthen it, it actually heals itself and becomes stronger. 
and replenishes itself. So somebody who does proper exercise, even though they're using their joints more than somebody who's sedentary, the person who exercises has healthier joints. So this belief that, oh, yeah, I got bad joints because I've been working out for 30 years. No, you've got bad joints because you've been working out wrong for 30 years. There's movement patterns that are wrong that have been happening and your joints haven't been working uh, optimally. And you're right, Adam, 100%. When something is tight, when your shoulder's tight, your back is tight, your IT band is tight, what your body's literally trying to do is it's trying to minimize movement by tightening the muscles because it senses that something's not moving right. And just loosening up those muscles will make you feel better temporarily, but you're not solving the root cause at all. Well, that's how you know you have a good trainer is that they may foam roll you, but then the work's not done, right? So yes. you foam roll and then you would go over to something that works on the mobility in the hip so and strengthens and, and gets control and stability there in the hip. So if you just foam roll and to give yourself temporary relief and then you go about your normal exercise routine, then you're going to keep, you're going to be in that constant, which is where I was for a long time. Yeah, foam roll every time. Yeah, it was a foam roll that before every uh, training session. And I had to just to give myself enough relief to go train legs and stuff and not realizing that I wasn't addressing the root cause, which was related to the instability of my hip. Next question is from The Real Rashton. Is occlusion training a waste of time or does it have a place in a routine to insert intermittently? Hell no, it's not a waste of time. Man, this is one of those weird, like this is the last time that I can remember where I heard something in fitness that was super weird and I was really yeah. skeptical and then it turned out to be true. And it has a lot of value. <laughs> you know, it was the first, weird. It was the very first mind pump tip that I ever gave on episode one. Oh, was it? Yeah. I, oh, I, yeah. I recently watched that. It, it, this one never aired, right? This was the one that we did with Craig Caperso years uh, years ago before Mind Pump started. Oh, this is the one at the house, right? Yeah, yeah. We're at the house, and you, Sal, talked about the decline of testosterone in young men, and then I brought occlusion training. And at that time, it was so new, and we were all kind of questioning it and talking about the science to support it and then kind of applying it ourselves. But I found tremendous value in it. Um, the The only thing that I would caution people of is that it's uh, there's so much value in it that you can start to neglect traditional strength training, which I don't think that it, it trumps traditional no, it doesn't. strength training. Mm. I think it's a nice, <coughs> excuse me, it's a nice supplement to it. Uh, but if you start to re uh, replace your traditional strength training and you start doing mostly occlusion training, I think you'll you'll lose some of the benefits that you would get from it. Yeah. So essentially, how it works is you uh, you tie off a limb and and you you tie off an enough, not so much that you lose feeling, but you tie off enough so that you occlude blood outflow. Right. So I if I do it to my arm, right, I'd go in my upper arm and knee wraps are usually what you would use. And you do some curls and blood gets into the muscle, but less blood comes out of the muscle because it's occluded. And so you start to get this really deep, intense burn. It burns. And this extreme, oh, man. And this extreme pump. Like it's an extreme pump like you've never experienced before, but it's also very painful. And what happens is it simulates heavy training to the body. So even though you're using, and you can't use heavy weight with this because when the burn kicks in, you, you, you lose function. You're just all of a sudden like, oh my God, I can't do another rep. But what it does is it actually stimulates the fast twitch muscle fibers in a similar way to heavy weight. So what are the, and also the extreme pump itself probably induces some, some muscle growth. So what are the benefits of this? Well, the benefits are I can train with really light weight and, and actually get a decent muscle building signal, man, th talk about the value for someone that's injured, right? Well, that, so. That's where this this originally came from, yes. was with athletes. And I want to say it was hockey, was where they, they first started doing this research around hockey players with like uh, knee injuries. So, uh, I mean, I didn't I didn't know about uh, occlusion training as a trainer. This wasn't until Mind Pump had started did, did I get introduced to this. Um, but boy, I would have used the shit out of it as a, as a trainer because many times I had clients fresh off of going through physical therapy yeah, yeah. and I had to do really, really lightweight and slow and controlled type of stuff mm -hmm. with them. And had I understood or knew about occlusion training back then, I would have found it as an incredible tool as a trainer and coach for rehabbing a client. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you want to min minimize impact on the joint, it's great. Like it's, it's a great rehab tool. 
to be able to still address, you know, muscle hypertrophy. Uh, and also I look at it too. There's, it's interesting because you said like, um, exercise, it sort of mimics, you know, uh, some of the exercise. So I'm thinking too of, of like a, a sauna, same thing. Like they, you know, how, how your body heats up and then, uh, you know, you get all the benefits of that. It, it simulates, uh, basically some of the benefits you get from exercise in your body, naturally heating up, uh, and producing, uh, you know, these benefits. Yeah. Now, now self-experimentation, cause when we first started the show and when you talked about this, Adam, you and I went through this period where we were just messing with it mm -hmm. just to see what it would do. And the body part that I was most consistent using it on was my calves because historically my calves have been very stubborn. Uh, they just didn't, you know, don't respond like the rest of my body. I know Adam, you know, same thing. And here's what I noticed from it. Like my calves, which basically were not going to grow. I mean, I know I trained them and they, that was it. They were stuck. I added almost a quarter of an inch to them by adding occlusion. Oh, so I, that's where I saw the same benefit. Which fact, is amazing. I'll send Andrew. I actually have a picture of you and I uh, <laughs> doing a, a calf flex off oh my in the original studio yeah. when we were actually doing this. So um, that's I've, I've used it mostly. There. I've used it for my arms too, but... Um, I saw the most value with my calves at being able to add volume without doing as much damage to the, to the muscle. Yes. Right? Now so you, you guys gained a few more veins. I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Fuck off, dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Kinkles, Kinkles, Andrews. I, I, now here's the deal. Uh, I, I experimented with it a lot. I even had some clients do it. You can overdo it. You could definitely overdo it and of overtrain. Course. It should not replace your traditional training. I don't think you should use it until you've built up a good amount of volume and frequency in normal training. It doesn't make any sense because it's still not as effective as traditional training. But let's say you've reached a particular point. You're hitting your, your sweet spot. You've been working out consistently for a while. You've got good volume, good frequency, and you want to add one more little trick, just kind of squeeze out a little bit more muscle growth or shape. Uh, in my experience, uh, throwing it in once a week was plenty. Once or twice a week, and I would literally do three sets. That's it. Any more than that, and I noticed then then it would start to take away, and I'd have to like replace traditional exercises, in which case it didn't make any sense. Um, I did it for, uh, I experimented for quads, hamstrings, calves, and arms. The downside is you can't occlude really the torso, so I can't do it for <laughs> chest or back. Or, you know, glutes. You could. It wouldn't go over too well. Yeah, I don't know how the hell you would <laughs> tie off your neck, you know? Yeah, Whoa. <laughs> yeah how would you do that? Um, but it, 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 it's very, very painful. You have never felt a burn. I mean, it is literally unbearable. I, I, when I'm done with the set, I rip the things off. and I, Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, it's, like it's a, another great tool, right? Uh, kind of like similar to the question about the elevated heels thing. It, it shouldn't uh, replace traditional strength training. Um, but I found tremendous value in it complementing my traditional routine. And then had I known about it as a trainer and coach back when I was training clients, for sure, I would have used this a lot because I trained a lot of, I mean, a lot of your clients uh, dealt with pain and surgery. I think that was uh, very, very common as a trainer to get clients like that. And so had I known about occlusion training back then, it would probably have been something I used on a fairly regular basis with clients. Oh yeah. Think about it. Like, you know, I, you know, I, when I work out, let's say if I squat, it's probably with 300 pounds, right? But let's say I have knee injury. I can't, you know, getting a workout with body weight now for me would be very difficult. It's too light. But if I occlude myself, oh, yeah. I bet body weight, I could get, I could, you know, send a little bit of a muscle building signal because even with body weight, the burn and everything would be insane and my muscles would eventually fatigue and fail very quickly. So it's a, a valuable tool. I would say use it once a week, maybe twice a week, only after. Well, we wrote a guide for this. You've been so we do. We have a guide that explains yeah. it. And then I think we did a YouTube video, didn't we? Do mm -hmm. a YouTube video? That kind yeah, of we've done down? a couple YouTube videos, and then we have a full guide on how to how the sets and reps and how we would actually implement it. Exactly. All right, look, uh, if you like our information, you got to head over to mindpumpfree.com. We have so much free content there that can help you build muscle, develop your body, burn body fat, sculpt your abs, get better squats. We even have guides for personal trainers. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can get them all and they cost nothing. You can also find all of us on social media. So you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.